I'm a big James Bond fan, particularly the first 10 movies or so, which may also explain the interest in watches and cars from an early age. The slow indoctrination on young minds can't be dismissed. My mum and grandpa were huge Bond fans, but the Bond movies from my time were with Roger Moore as Bond, and I have to admit, whilst he has some very silly stuff to work with occasionally, The Spy Who Loved Me is still one of my all-time favourites, and he was the only James Bond to me for a long time. The watches from that era were often digital and had odd things like poison arrows and pop-up messages. Unlike Connery's era, which were Rolex Submariners that to this day look timeless and fantastic. Eventually, a certain Remington Steel, or rather Pierce Brosnan, came along, and both Omega and somehow BMW became the default Bond watch and car suppliers. Mercifully, Aston Martin eventually came back, but Omega stayed put. We've had some interesting Seamasters come and go, but the final Daniel Craig movie had something very special and perhaps a little controversial. The Seamaster Diver 300m 007 edition. It's an all dark brown and so called Fotina affair, and since it is a titanium case and bracelet, it's also remarkably light, which some people don't appreciate since weight is often associated with quality, and having something so light on your wrist can feel a bit odd. I've seen plenty of pictures of this, and my thoughts were that it was certainly both eye catching and unusual, and therefore a pretty good send off for Daniel Craig as Bond. But when my friend Chris offered to lend me his, I had to admit that handling this in person, it really is something else. I'm quite smitten, it looks so good on the wrist that I really don't want to hand it back. I'm sorry Chris. So regardless of how you feel about large Swiss brands aligning themselves with fictional characters that are not to everyone's tastes, let's take a closer look at this remarkable looking Omega. I like to cover sizes immediately here since it's such a crucial part of a watch buy. Perhaps less so here being a special edition and such a collector's item, but nevertheless, this has a perfect set of specs. It's 42mm in diameter, 49.3mm lug to lug, 20mm lug width, 13mm thick, and on the bracelet it comes in at 97 grams all up. So this is on paper not a small watch, but it does wear more like a 40 to me, which I think has to do with the weight and also the relatively broad bezel. Either way, it is a supremely comfortable wear, and smaller wrists than mine will have no issues here. So let's have a closer look at the dial. It's not the most legible of dials from a distance, it's actually very dark chocolate brown and not black. And if it's even a tad dark, you'd want to make sure that the loom has been charged up properly. But it sure looks cool with these colour combos on the skin. All indices are applied with double bars at 12. This is also where you find the colour matched Omega logo, the Seamaster model name in red, which is colour matched by the red tip of the seconds hand, and the word professional. At just about the 6, we get the coaxial and master chronometer print, we shall come back to when we talk movement, and the water resistance of 300 meters. Overall, I think it's a gorgeous combination of colors. One small fun detail is the broad arrow mark, traditionally used to mark an item as the property of the Ministry of Defense, but here it's just a small easter egg referring to James Bond's rank of commander in the Royal Navy. The skeletonized hands of the modern Seamasters are synonymous with the model now, and they are certainly unusual. When they are black on a white dial, they make sense and are clearly legible. Here it's just a matter of following suit as a feature of the Seamasters, and that's okay. The hour hand with its cradle ball of loom, and the minute hand with its triangle look amazing at night. So that's something to look forward to both for the owner in daily use, and for you later on in this video. The bezel has a good feel with no back play and just like the dial it's made from aluminium. The large numbers on the bezel are extremely easy to read 
So in theory, on your dark dive, with only the loom available for you to see how long you've been underwater for, they would be quite useful. In practice and everyday wear, they look really good. Within the vessel is a domed sapphire crystal that has the added benefit of making the minor markers on the dial really stand out and create some interesting distortions from various angles. It is a particularly pleasant curve here on the crystal, if that even makes sense. Or maybe I've had one beer too many, or both perhaps. The titanium case is simply awesome. I'm a big fan of the dark grey sheen of titanium, and in combination with the dark brown tones in use here, it looks particularly good. The classic Omega lugs, the sculpted crown guards, all adds up to a brilliant looking case that's sensibly all brushed and soft to the touch. The crown is easy to grip, signed and well protected in said sculpted crown guards. One thing that I'm yet to get used to is the helium escape valve at the 10 o'clock position of all these modern Seamasters. I found this detail just plain silly. It's nothing but a cosmetic crown that sticks out for no good reason and would be useless to every single owner of this watch. Okay, so I got that out of my system and I can now at least admit that it does add some visual interest, but overall I'd rather it was not there. And if you had to have such a pointless feature, I think Tudor does it well with a flat valve. If this is now really making you angry, please feel free to comment, but only if you are in fact a deep sea diver that relies on this feature to not blow out your crystal after your deep sea welding expedition. Just kidding, any comment is good, so thank you. On the back of the watch, we have the classic 007 wordmark, and behind the case back is the self-winding movement with the coaxial escapement. This is a certified master chronometer, approved by METAS, resistant to magnetic fuels reaching 15,000 gas. It has a special luxury finish with rhodium plated rotor and bridges with Geneva waves and arabesque, which you'll likely never see. But I suppose it's a nice little detail for the service department. It has a 55 hour power reserve and you can expect tolerances of minus zero to plus five seconds per day, which is rather impressive. The bracelet deserves a mention. It'll set you back a full 1700 Australian dollars over the NATO strap edition. So is it worth that sort of money? Um, according to my brain, no. According to my long suffering and easily corruptible heart, yes. It's signed on both the buckle and adjustment and all titanium like the rest of the watch. The adjustment feature alone is hard not to play with continuously since it's just so cool and smooth and slots nicely into these reinforced holes. Titanium does make sense for a bracelet since it adjusts to your skin's temperature much faster than steel, so this will be comfortable no matter how cold or hot it is where you are. The bracelet is 2.2mm thick and the pattern it forms is quite fascinating to watch in any light. It's the first Milanese style bracelet I've ever really gotten into. It's really nicely made and I like it very much. Would I pay $1700 for it on its own? Well, if I'm already spending 15,000 Australian dollars on a watch, then yes, I would. The loom is yet another brilliant detail, but I'll be mercifully quiet here and let you make your own mind up. I would be the first to admit that a James Bond watch sounds like something that you would buy at Toys R Us and it would come with a die car scale 1 to 18 car with a removable roof and plastic machine guns. But this watch is so much more than the association with the fictional character. Daniel Craig is a brilliant Bond in my opinion with two very good Bond movies. And at least according to Omega's website, he had a bit to do with the design and approach to materials. Even if you couldn't care less about that, 
it's hard to deny how distinct this design is in person and how absolutely beautiful the color combinations are. To me, it's the best looking Seamaster by a fair margin. And it is a shame that it's so much more money than a standard Seamaster and that it's limited to, to 7,007 watches only. Whilst that's not too restrictive in numbers, 15,000 Australian dollars certainly is quite restrictive. In a few weeks, I'll have the black and white Seamaster in, so let's check in again then to see how that compares. Until then, thank you very much for watching and I raise my vodka martini to you my friend, shaken but definitely not stirred.